From Chicago, Illinois, the Voice of Prophecy presents live The Midnight Cry with Kenneth Cox, an adventure in understanding where we are in the light of Bible prophecy. Over the last few years, I have had the opportunity of becoming acquainted with a very special person. Uh, this individual is one that, as I have become acquainted with him, I really have become very much aware of his sincerity, of his love for the Lord Jesus Christ, and an individual that's willing to lay it all down for Jesus Christ. An individual that's willing to put Christ over and above everything else. And I, as a result of that, I have really appreciated very much his friendship, the opportunity to get acquainted with him. This individual has written uh, 10 number one hits. When he gave his heart to the Lord, he decided that he would just concentrate on songs that would uplift humanity in Jesus Christ. Tonight he's going to sing a song that he's written himself. It's entitled, Lord, Help Me Slow Down This Life of Mine. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like for you to welcome Mr. Roy Drusky of the Grand Ole Opry. Heavenly Father, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for your word. It gives us insight, it helps us understand where we are. Lord, 
May we not get so busy, so wrapped up in the things of this world that we don't have time to slow down our lives and to spend time with you. Give us understanding tonight that we may see and clearly understand the events that are before us. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. A lot of individuals thought that something dramatic, something unbelievable was going to take place. It's going to happen at the close of 2000. Uh, as Pastor Meloshenko mentioned, uh, Y2K, they thought this was sure to bring an end, bring catastrophe, many things would happen that it would usher in a millennium. Other people said, no, nah, really, the millennium doesn't really begin until 2001. And so there's a lot of people saying, no, nah, it really doesn't start until 2001. And so there's some people that still think that come the end of this year that there's going to be dramatic things that are going to happen. There's other people that say, no, nah, you can't really go by that. You've got to go by the Jewish calendar. You can't go by our calendar. You've got to go by the Jewish calendar. And there's a number of years left on the Jewish calendar. So you find there's a lot of different ideas about the millennium. What you and I need to understand is we need to understand what God's Word says. That's what we need to understand. We need to understand exactly where we are. And by understanding what God's Word says, you and I, without question, can rest our faith. Told you before, told you the other night, you do not, you do not build your faith on a church. You build your faith on the Word of God. It's by the Word of God that I know and understand. That's why the Scripture has this to say to us here in 2 Peter, 1st chapter, verse 19. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. So the scripture says, if there's anything that's sure, anything that we can count on, it's the word of God. We can count on it. So tonight, what we need to do is find out just exactly what does God's Word say about this thousand years. That's what we need to find out tonight. Known as the millennium. No such word in Scripture as the millennium. Just a Latin word that means thousand years. But there are certain things that you and I need to establish as we look at it tonight. One thing that we need to establish is when does the thousand years start and when does it end? When is the thousand years going to start? Is there, will the scripture tell me exactly when that thousand years starts? Will it tell me what, when that thousand years is going to come to an end? I was visiting with a lady and uh, we were talking about this thousand years and she told me, she said, oh, we already lived during that thousand years. And I said, you mean the thousand years has already started? And she said, that's right. And I said, well, my Bible tells me that the devil is chained during that thousand years. And she said, oh, that's right, he's chained up. And I said, if it is, he's on a rubber chain because he gets around to me quite often, you know. <laughs> See, so what you and I need to know is when does that thousand years start? When does it end? We need to understand what's happening during that thousand years. Why does God say there's a thousand years? What's going to go on during that thousand years? We need to establish tonight where are the righteous going to be? Where are all the saints going to be during this thousand years? Where are the wicked going to be during the thousand years? Those are things that we simply need to establish in understanding what the Bible says about the thousand years. So with that, let's take a look at Revelation, the 20th chapter, that mentions the thousand years, and we're going to read several verses, see what God's Word has to say about it. Revelation 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, 
who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into a bottomless pit, shut him up, set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness for, to Jesus for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a, for a thousand years. So here it talks about a thousand years. So it tells us that the devil's going to be bound during that thousand years, that the saints are going to live and reign for a thousand years, and that judgment was committed to them. Now, here in Revelation 20, verse 6, it tells us where this thousand years starts. So watch carefully. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So it tells us very clearly that this thousand years is going to begin with a resurrection. That is how the millennium or the thousand years is going to start is with the resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. So it tells us that the thousand years begins with the first resurrection and that it will end, this thousand years will come to an end also with the resurrection. Now let's take a look at the scripture and watch as it puts it together for us. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's the first resurrection. The dead in Christ will rise first. That's the first resurrection. Then if we take a look at Revelation 20, verse 5, it says but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Now, if I have all the righteous being resurrected in the first resurrection, and it says, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished, then that has to be the second resurrection, or it is referred to in Scripture as the resurrection of condemnation. You with me? Follow me, let's look at another text. It puts it all together for us. John 5, 28. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life. That's the first resurrection. All those that have done good to the resurrection of life. Watch as it continues and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. That is the second resurrection. Those two resurrections are separated by 1,000 years. Okay? That's simply what the Scripture tells us about these 1,000 years. So what we need to do now is we need to find out what happens at the beginning. What are the events that all take place here at the beginning? Well, to begin with, Jesus is going to come, right? Has to come because that's what causes the resur resurrection of the righteous. So Jesus has to come back, as it says here in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So all those people down through the ages who have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. They have looked forward to the day when he's going to come back. They're going to be resurrected from the grave. They're going to come up out of the grave. Scripture describes it with these points, these words. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So all those people 
that have died in the hope of Christ, accepting him as their Savior, those people are going to come out of the grave immortal, changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. They will put on immortality. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Marvelous promise. So when Jesus comes, he calls all those that have died in faith from the grave, they come out of that grave immortal. Never, 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 friend, to die. Just think. Scripture says that when they come forth the grave, there won't be any more sorrow. There won't be any more pain. There won't be any more sickness. There won't be any more death. All those things will have passed away, never to be again. Marvelous promise that God gives. Also, it tells us that with Jesus coming, and the resurrection of the righteous, it tells us that something's going to happen to the people who are living on the earth. Those that are living on the earth when Jesus comes, the Scripture says that they're going to be caught up with those people who have been resurrected to meet the Lord in the air. So they're going to have the privilege of seeing Jesus as he comes in the clouds of heaven, and it says this is what will happen to them. 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 4, 17, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So all those people who are alive, waiting for Jesus to come, they're going to see him come in the clouds of heaven, and in a moment, in a moment, they're going to be changed. Just like that, their bodies are going to be changed. They'll become immortal, and with those that have been resurrected, they will be caught up in the air to meet the Lord. Marvelous promise to each one of you. Let me tell you, I don't care tonight. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. The Lord Jesus Christ promises to you that you can have that privilege of being among those that will see Jesus come or among those that will be resurrected from the grave you can have that privilege by accepting him. That's a promise that he gives to every one of you here tonight. What about those people that are living, the wicked, that are living when Jesus comes? The wicked that are dead, what? They're not disturbed because it says the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. So they're not bothered. When Jesus comes and he shouts, and his words roll through this earth like peals of thunder, and all the dead in Jesus Christ that are in their grave, they hear that voice, and they come out. The wicked don't hear that. They don't hear it. They're not disturbed. But the Scripture tells us about the wicked that are living here on the earth. What will happen to them? 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So this is talking about the coming of Jesus. In flaming fire. I mean, it says when he comes back, he's going to be revealed in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it says when he comes back, he's going to come back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that have not served him, have not accepted him, have not followed him. In fact, the Bible goes on and describes it with these words, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So it says they will be destroyed. It tells us how they're going to react. Here in Revelation, the 19th chapter, or excuse me, the 6th chapter, in verse 14, it describes it with these words. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the commanders and the mighty men, every slave 
and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains, the rocks, fall on us. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. Who is able to stand? Now, I run on to some people that tell me that when Jesus comes, uh, people aren't going to know it. They're, they say that the, the righteous are going to kind of be just whisked out of here and, and uh, the wicked are going to look around and say, where did everybody go? Uh, dear friends, let me ask you something. If mountains start moving and islands start disappearing and the heavens split and rolls back like a scroll, do you think you'll know something's going on? I, I think I would. I think I would know that something was taking place because it says that they will literally cry for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them, hide them from the face of him that sits on the throne. It's coming back. It says that all the wicked will be destroyed, will be destroyed at the coming of Jesus Christ. They will be slain. They will fall. They'll be destroyed. Now, let me ask you something tonight. If when Jesus comes and all the righteous that are dead are resurrected and all the righteous that are living are caught up with him and caught up into the air and taken to heaven and all the wicked who are dead are not disturbed and the wicked that are living are slain, then let me ask you who's left. Nobody. Listen to the scripture. Revelation 20, verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into a lake of fire and brimstone. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit, a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him a for a thousand years. So it says that bound the devil for a thousand years. Now, it said he had a great chain in his hand, and he bound the devil for a thousand years. Do you think a chain would hold the devil? Huh? Well, I can read to you where Christ and the disciples went over the shore of the Gadarenes, and it talked about these two men come running out of the tombs, the scripture says they had been bound with chains and had broken them asunder. Now, if chains won't hold a man, they certainly wouldn't hold the devil, would they? So what does it mean when he said he had a great chain in his hand and he bound the devil for a thousand years? Well, have you ever had somebody come over to your house and said, uh, uh, go to town with me, and you'd say, well, I really would like to, but I'm tied down. What did you mean? Well, you meant circumstances didn't permit you to go. The circumstances have bound the devil. That's what's bounding. The righteous are in heaven. The wicked are dead. The devil is bound for 1,000 years. That's what happens here. So five events, five events take place at the beginning of 1,000 years. These are the five events. One, second coming of Jesus. That's going to happen. Jesus is going to come. With the coming of Jesus, all the righteous dead are going to be resurrected. Okay? Thirdly, all the righteous living are going to be translated and taken to heaven. Four, the wicked living are going to be slain. And five, the devil is going to be bound. Bound for a thousand years. Now, what's going to happen here on earth? What's going to take place during this thousand years? And why are the righteous going to spend a thousand years up in heaven? Well, let's look and see what the scripture has to tell us. Satan is bound for 1,000 years. God gives him. God gives him a thousand years to think over all the sin, all the crime, all the degradation, and all the things that he has done as part of his punishment. A thousand years to think over what he has done. What's the earth like? What's the condition of the earth during this thousand years? Behold, Isaiah 24, 1, Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its surface, and scatters abroad its inhabitants. It says the Lord is going to make this earth empty. Righteous are in heaven. Wicked are dead. The earth is empty. All right, distorts its surface. 
the land shall be entirely emptied and utterly plundered, for the Lord has spoken this word. So it says the whole land is going to be absolutely empty. There won't be anybody here. The devil is given that as part of his punishment. In fact, this is what it says will happen to the wicked. Jeremiah 25, 33. And at that day, the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuge on the ground. So it says that the coming of Jesus, that he will come as a consuming fire. It says the wicked will fall to the ground. They won't be gathered. They won't be lamented. They won't be buried. Fall right there. That's what's going to happen to them. The earth is going to be desolate during this thousand years. Now, if the wicked are dead, they don't know anything, what are the righteous going to be doing? And, and, and why would they spend a thousand years up in heaven? What's the purpose of this? Well, Revelation 20, verse 6 gives you an idea. Watch. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So it says they're going, the righteous are going to go to heaven. They're going to live and reign with him there for a thousand years what are they going to be doing during that thousand years? Verse 4, the 20th chapter says, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Hmm. The righteous during that thousand years are going to be given what? Huh? Judgment. When are the righteous given judgment, folks? Come on. During the thousand years. I just want to get that clear because I run on to some saints that think judgment's been given to them now. No, not now, during the thousand years. I even have some people say, well, I'm not judging, I'm just a fruit inspector. No, you're not even a fruit inspector, you know. That's, uh, that's God's responsibility. Judgment is given to them during the thousand years. Who are they going to judge? Who will they judge during this thousand years? 1 Corinthians 6, 2. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Okay. Do you not know that we shall judge angels? Okay, so it says they're going to judge the world that will even judge angels. Why, why is judgment going to be given to the righteous? Have you ever, have you ever thought about that? Hmm? You ever given any thought to that? Well... Uh, let's, say, uh, let's say you get to heaven and you look around and somebody you knew who you thought was a Christian is not there. What are you going to do? You're going to go through eternity saying, wonder where John is. Strange. I thought he would have been here. I wonder why John didn't make it. Oh, I better keep my mouth shut. Better not say anything. Strange that John didn't make it. Now, let me tell you something. God doesn't intend for you to get 10,000 years into eternity and all of a sudden yell, Hey, where's John? No, that's not going to happen. So God is going to open up the books. That's why the books are kept up in heaven, folks. He's going to open up the books, and he's going to let you look at them, and he's going to let you be absolutely convinced in your heart and in your soul that God did everything that he could to save every last soul. Let me tell you something tonight. If you don't make it into heaven, it won't be God's fault. God's not trying tonight to keep you out of heaven. God's trying to get you into heaven. So he's going to open up the books. The righteous are going to go through it, and they're going to be absolutely convinced in their heart and in their soul that God did everything he could to save every person. Now, we come down to the end of the thousand years. Something begins to happen because it tells us that up in heaven, there's a city called the New Jerusalem that Jesus has made. Revelation 21, 2 then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, 
coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So all of a sudden, at the end of this thousand years, down comes the new Jerusalem. Now the righteous, folks, the righteous were taken to heaven at the beginning of the thousand years, and they have spent a thousand years in the new Jerusalem. But now it's coming back to this earth. Beautiful city, beyond description. And it tells us exactly where it's going to settle. Did you know that? Zechariah, 14th chapter, verse 4. And in that day, his feet, Jesus' feet, will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move towards the north and half of it towards the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach unto Azel. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with him. So it says here that all the righteous that have been up there in heaven with him, they're going to come back. That new Jerusalem is going to touch. His feet are going to touch the Mount of Olives. It's going to split, going to become a huge plain, and that's where the new Jerusalem is going to come to rest. I was over in Israel. Had gone over to the Dome of the Rock, top of Mount uh, Moriah. And there on the Dome of the Rock, or there on the top is the Dome of the Rock, which is a Muslim shrine. There's nothing in that shrine, folks, except a rock. That rock is very, very, uh, how should I say, sacred in a sense to Jews and to Muslims and to Christians. You see, they believe that it was upon that rock that Abraham was going to offer Isaac. The Muslim believes it was on that rock that Abraham was going to offer Ishmael. The Christians believe it was on that rock where Abraham was going to offer Isaac. They also believe that that rock was the threshing floor of Nacon the Jebusite, and they believe that it was on that rock where the temple altar of sacrifice was. So that rock is very, very special to them. And so I had gone there, and I was just inside the shrine looking when this guide that I became very well acquainted with, a Jew, came up to me and he said, would you like to see something? And I said, sure. And so he took me around to the other side of it, and here he opened a door, and here turned on a light, and here was a stairway going down under the rock. He walked down the stairway, and I followed him. Got down there, and I realized now that this rock I had been looking at now was the ceiling of this room. And there was nobody in there but the guide and myself. And he said to me, he said, "Uh, what do you see? I looked around, and I said, "I just a vacant room. And I said, that's all I see. He said, you need to look a little closer. So I tried to look closer, but I couldn't figure out what he was talking about. Finally, he said, let me show you. And he went over to the edge of it, and he pointed up the ceiling. He said, you see that crack? Followed it clear across the room. He said, uh, he said, we've only had one earthquake here. And he said, that took place in 31 A.D. And he picked up a Bible and turned over to Matthew, the 27th chapter, and read verse 51, where it says that when Jesus died, the earthquake and the rocks split. And he said, that earthquake split this rock. Well, there wasn't anybody down there but me and this guide who was a Jew, and I thought, this is a good time to ask him a question. And so I said to him, I said, "Uh, are you going to rebuild the temple? Oh, he said, absolutely. And I said, "Uh, I don't understand. I said, next to Mecca, this is probably the most sacred spot to the Uh, Muslim, all you and I would have to do is do one thing to this, to to deface it or destroy it, and we'd be in trouble, we'd be in the biggest war you've ever seen. He said, oh, we aren't going to do that. Uh, Then he picked up his Bible, 
and turned over to Zechariah that I just read to you, to the 14th chapter, and he read that text to me that we just read, see? And he said, oh, he said, the Messiah is coming back. His feet are going to touch the Mount of Olives. He said, you see that crack? He said, that didn't just crack that rock. He said, that's a fault line. He said, it not only runs through here, it crosses the valley of Jehoshaphat and it splits the Mount of Olives in two. And he said, when, when the Messiah comes back, his feet will touch this and he said, it'll split this place wide open and he said, then we will rebuild the temple. And I said, I have one problem with that. And he said, what's your problem with that? And I said, the problem I'm having with that is you tell me that that rock there was split at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And he looked at me, and I said, and I believe he's the one coming back. And he turned and walked up the steps. You see, but what I'm trying to get across to you tonight, as far as I can tell, that rock split that mountain has a fault line right through it, waiting, waiting for the feet of Jesus Christ. When it comes, it's going to split, and that new Jerusalem that Jesus made is going to come, and it's going to settle right here on this old earth. What about the dead? What about all the wicked that have been dead? Scripture says this about them. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Hmm. Didn't live again until the thousand years were finished. Oh, friend, let me tell you something. There's so much difference between those two resurrections. The resurrection of the righteous. Over here, I read to you, it says that when they come forth, they are changed in a moment in a twink of an eye. It says that this mortal must put on immortality. It means that if that person was blind when he died, he comes out seeing. It means if he went into that grave with one arm missing, he comes out with both arms. It means if he went into that grave crippled, he comes out whole. Do you understand that? That is not promised on this resurrection of the wicked. If that person's blind and they don't know Jesus Christ and they died blind, they come out blind. They come out just like they went in. Nothing promised here. No change. No immortality. Are you telling me tonight? Are you telling me tonight that you'll give that up for this old world? That you'll give it up? No way. No way. They come forth in the grave. Thick as the sands of the sea. Enoch. Seventh from Adam prophesied about it. Jude, the first chapter, verse 14. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have, committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So it says he's coming back to execute judgment. Well, the devil has been given a thousand years to think over all the trouble and all the crime and everything, but all of a sudden, here at the end of the thousand years, all the wicked are resurrected. He now has people. That's why it says when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. You see, he's no longer bound because now he has people to work with. He has people to tempt. He has something to do. And let me assure you that during that thousand years, he hasn't been sitting there twiddling his thumbs. He has a plan. He knows exactly what he's going to do. Watch very carefully because he has a plan. And will go out to what? Deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sands of the sea. So it says that he goes out to deceive all the wicked and he gathers them. They're as thick as the sands of the sea. And it says here in Revelation 20 verse 9, And they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, the beloved city, 
and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Now, why? Uh, why, why would that happen? Why don't the wicked just go over on the other side of the earth and say, we'll stay over here and let the righteous stay over there and we won't bother them and maybe they won't bother us? Why, why go up and surround the city and try to take it? Why, why do that? The devil has a master plan. You see, when they came forth from the grave, the wicked, they're not immortal. They're mortal. They're subject to death. Back when God created man in the Garden of Eden, he put something in the Garden of Eden called the tree of life. Listen to what it says here, Genesis 3, 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, man has become like one of us to know good and evil. Now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and... Come on live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till, till the ground from which he was taken. He said, lest man take, he put an angel there, put an angel guarding the tree. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. So God made it impossible for man to eat of the tree of life. You know where the tree of life is now? Hmm? It's in the New Jerusalem. And at the end of the thousand years, the New Jerusalem comes back to this earth. Revelation 22, 2. And in the middle of the street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The trees of the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. The devil convicts, convinces the wicked that if they can just storm the city, get inside and eat of the tree of life, they'll live, they'll not die. So they go up. Great, great masses of humanity and they surround the new Jerusalem. This is where the scripture says that the great white throne judgment takes place. You think tonight, all of a sudden, right there, this particular moment in history or in time, right there inside the New Jerusalem are all the righteous that have ever lived. Outside the city are all the wicked that have ever lived. So standing there before God now is all mankind and all of a sudden, God is lifted up and the great white throne judgment takes place. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away and there was found no place for them. Here they stand. They're all mankind. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God and the books were open. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works. Oh, dear friend, tonight, if your name is in the book of life, at this point, if your name's in the book of life, Jesus has already pleaded your case up in heaven, and you have been marked as having eternal life. They read through the books. If you given your heart to Jesus Christ. Christ has stood up and said, Father, I plead my blood in behalf of this person. Give them life eternal. And you have come forth in the grave, immortal, as the scripture says. The wicked, by these, by the things which were written in the books, they were judged. The wicked get up off their knees and they try to take the city. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints, the beloved city. Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The wicked go up, they surround the city. Fire, which rained down out of heaven, devours them. That new Jerusalem will ride those flames just like the ark 
road with flood because it says that this old earth of ours will be burned. It says death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You see, if you know Jesus Christ tonight as your personal Savior, if you've given your heart to him, then you will only die once. You may not die at all if you live long enough to see Jesus come. But if you don't, you will only die once. But if you don't accept Jesus Christ, you'll die twice because you will be resurrected in the second resurrection and you will be destroyed at the end. You will die twice. It offers to you tonight life in Jesus Christ. This old earth that you and I have lived in, referred to as being burnt like a lake of fire, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And the Bible describes this old earth and its condition because it talks about it here in 2 Peter 3, verse 12, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to our promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So the old earth is going to be burned, and then when it's through burning, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to make it brand new. And so the Bible tells you and I that there are things that are waiting for the righteous that you and I have a new world to look forward to. Oh, how marvelously it, marvelously it will be. Listen, this is what it tells us about it. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Brand new earth. So you find that there are five events that close the millennium of a thousand years. Those five events are, one, the new Jerusalem is going to come back to this earth at the end of the thousand years. After that, all the wicked that have died are going to be resurrected. Then we find that Satan's going to be set free because he now has people to work with. He has people to tent. And then the wicked will be destroyed at the end of the thousand years and the earth will be made new. Because the scripture says in Matthew 5, 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So God gives us a marvelous promise. Revelation twenty two ten, 10. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Time is here. As a boy... As I've mentioned to you, I was born here, lived here until I was nine years of age. Uh, my parents told me of an incident that happened here in Chicago. There was a salesman from out of town that had come here to Chicago. Evidently had had a busy day, and he checked into a hotel down on the loop. Went to bed, tired. But about two in the morning, he was shaken out of sleep by the sound of a siren. Jumped up to realize that the hotel he was in was on fire. Uh, he could hear the sirens. He could smell the smoke. Oh. And he grabbed the telephone and by some chance was able to get an outside line and called his boss. And he told his boss that he was in this hotel and it was on fire and he was going to give him a moment-by-moment -moment account of what it was like to be in a hotel on fire. He said, this is a chance for me to give a story like no one's ever heard. His boss said, you get out of there and you get out of there now. 
And he said, no. He said, my escape's okay. I've got it all figured out. I'm all right. And he began to describe to him about the horrors of a hotel on fire. He talked about how the fire evidently had broken out on the second floor and how the smoke was making its way up the stairways and up the elevator shafts and up the laundry chutes. He talked about how hearing people run down the hall screaming and yelling and he said that there were people piled up at the stairway and at the elevator shaft where they had run over one another trying to get out of the hotel. He talked about how the smoke was so bad as it went down the halls and people were suffocating from the smoke. He talked about how the fire, the heat, was sucking the oxygen out of the air and how you had to bend over just to be able to breathe. He described all the horrors of a hotel that was on fire Finally, the telephone lines were gone. And he went over to the window to make his way out on the fire escape to take down to safety. Opened the window, only to find out that the fire escape was red hot. He shouted to the firemen below to stretch out their nets, that he was going to jump. And they stretched out their nets, and he jumped, but missed the net. Dear friend, let me tell you something. I run on a lot of people that think they're going to hang on to this old world to the last moment, and then they're going to jump. I have people say, oh, not right now. Let me tell you something. The Bible says today is the day. It's going to be people going to say, oh, the summer's ended, the harvest is past. We're not saved tonight. Jesus is inviting you. Accept him as your Savior. Give your heart to him. Prepare for his coming, as Maddie sings. Years have come and years have gone Since Jesus went away Leaving us this promise that he'd come you would take that white card so you receive each evening as you come in. If you don't have one, would you please uh, hold up your hand. Our ushers will give you one. We'd like everybody to have one. Three questions I'd like for you to look at with me tonight. First question says, I realize we're approaching the second coming of Christ. Dear friend, if you've been with me from night to night and we've gone down through the prophecies, and you've seen how we've moved right down to the end of time. Certainly in your heart tonight, you should believe, believe that we're living at the time of Christ's return. Put a check by number one. Second question says, I'd like to accept Christ as my Savior. Tonight, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I'd like to invite you to accept him, just to reach out in faith tonight and accept him as your personal Savior. Put a check by number two on that card. And the third question says, following Christ's command, I'd like to be baptized. If you have given your heart to Jesus Christ and you need to follow him in baptism, check that card. If you'd like to be rebaptized, check that card. Take that step, following him in baptism. Put your name, your address on it. Fill it out as Maddie sings. What if this would be the year that Jesus comes? The year that we've been waiting for so long. We wouldn't have much time to get a Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus, for his love, and for his care over our lives. We pray that you'll bless each one here, that 
their hearts may be surrendered to you and that they might be among those that will look up into the heavens and will say, Lo, this is our God. We've waited for him and he'll save us. For all the things that you do for each one of us, we give to you honor and glory and praise in Christ's name. Amen.